through my old sermon notes um, because I want to get some use out of them and don't want to admit that they're completely useless. Um, mostly it's just to pick apart different elements of Christianity and kind of demonstrate to myself that I'm going in the right direction. Um, it's just, it's a relief kind of going through these because it's like, oh, okay, I'm not actually losing anything by throwing out these notes. Um, Acts 10, 9 through 22, Peter has a dream about unclean animals and the Holy Spirit alights on Gentiles. My mom is one of these people who says that the Holy Spirit, capital H, capital S, is only translated correctly when it's got that capital S in front of it. Uh, what she might not realize is that unseals didn't come along until a lot later. I mean, we're talking like, um, I think it's Carolingian, which is not until the year 900 or so. Um, I think maybe even later than then, like around the time of the Norman Conquest in 1066. Um, but even the Holy Spirit being a thing, uh, you know, being part of the Trinity didn't come along until 300 plus years after the New Testament was written. And I say written, really, it's just kind of thrown together. Prejudice was encouraged by the law. Okay. <coughs> Discernment is different from prejudice. Um, you can be prejudice uh, against some crime. You could be discerning with who you're hanging out with. James 2, 9. Favoritism is a sin unless it's you're supposed to minister to this special group that we've defined before other groups. Leviticus 19.15, no economic prejudice, uh, with a gajillion other um, caveats to that, saying that yes, you can be prejudiced economically. Stephen was the first martyr, except that we don't have any evidence that he was actually killed at all, or even existed. Acts 9, 13 through 14, Ananias tries to inform the all-knowing Lord about Saul's evils. Um, so that's a case of the Lord allowing evil because it furthers his agenda. Satan wants you to not to be an evangelist. They don't cite a verse for that one, though. Uh, I've got a note here that says, God will use you if you are willing. Um, they've also got something that says, God will use you even if you're not willing, that God's plans are going to be exacted whether or not you help with it. So on the one hand, they're trying to guilt trip you into doing something. Um because it will further God's plans, and on the other, they're saying, we don't actually need you. So they're trying to guilt trip you into acting, because they want you to kind of prove yourself. Look at God's revealed will, which is, of course, through the Bible and through preachers. <laughs> I'm, I'm scoffing at it now, but, like, back then it was serious, and, you know, I took it literally and <sighs> took it for granted that that's the way it was supposed to be. The greater your understanding of God's revealed will is, the stronger you feel your feel for God's specific will. So, there's the idea here that once you read the Bible, you'll know what God specifically wants for you. Which, of course, both are just based on intuition, built on teaching coming from humans.
when you are obedient, it is easier to see God's specific will. It's convenient for the church, too, because that's a, when you're obedient, they are better able to control you, which, I mean, is really what all the, all the acts of the church are about, which is, you know, controlling your money, controlling your manner of dress, who you associate with, um, you know, your plans for your own life, that kind of stuff. We aren't led by angels or obvious signs, unless it's something that the church really cares about, in which case, you've got to do this. The Holy Spirit is identifiable, but not quantifiable. I am sure that there's a logical hole in there, um, but it lies in semantics. Uh, the real problem is that it's not really defined clearly anywhere, aside from just being an amorphous thing that really isn't part of the Trinity at all, because the Trinity isn't a thing, because it's not even a Jesus and God, it's just God, if you look at the first three Gospels, and then suddenly it changes to plus Jesus in John, and then it changes to plus the Holy Spirit in Acts. God cares about every single person. He notices missing souls and refuses to take any kind of responsibility for the fact that he's the one condemning them to hell if they don't go along with what he says to do. The more you obey, the faster you can discern instruction. And instruction, I guess, in this context would refer to commands to obey. Um, I've read that Christianity was intended to be something that favors the rich or favors slaveholders, and you got this especially with the Presbyterians in the U.S. Civil War in the South. Um, you know, they had whole support of the scriptures behind them, um, and I've listened to podcasts and um, audio recordings of preachers that talk about how slavery is actually not such a bad thing. So the incentive here is obey, 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 and things will go well for you. And the better you are at obeying, the better you'll be able to be at obeying God. God will leave you out of your comfort zone. Um, there's no verse to that they cite for this claim, but um, the idea here is that the more uncomfortable you are, the more godly you are. As you follow God's revealed will, the Holy Spirit will make appointments to know God's specific will, um, unless, of course, you claim something that isn't what the church wants, in which case you're probably a Wiccan or a Neo-Pagan or something. Um, people have talked before about how um, the devil changes in character and really is an evolving structure in the Old and New Testament. Um, John eight forty four, the devil is the father of lies. Elsewhere, you know, you've just got this assumption that they're the same person um, when you're talking about these various spirits at different points in the Bible um, and the role that they play, but really it's just inconsistent. It's just, oh, it's stuff that we don't like, therefore it, it must be one evil spirit, and they just kind of create this character who's an agglomeration of multiple characters seen throughout the scriptures. Kind of like Jesus. Acts 4 and 5, uh, or Acts 4 verse 5. Ananias and Sapphira lie and die, which I'm sure was done by God and not by Christians who didn't like what they were doing. They were holding out um, money from the church, I think, or something. Um, which, of course, is a punishable by a sin punishable by death. 
When a Christ follower opens his mouth, the only thing that comes out is the truth, so if somebody lies, then they must not be a Christian. So basically, this is a way of absolving Christianity itself as a movement of any kind of um, ill-behaving characters. Don't expose yourself to profanity. Um, censorship. Don't lie. Don't take God's name in vain. Wow, don't lie. That's something I couldn't figure out outside of the scriptures. Do not speak God's name casually. Again, trying to make people afraid to just live their lives. Your godly speech can win over infidels. Good luck with that. 40% of the USA says they were born again, and that number is probably getting smaller. This is back in 2006, 2007 maybe. Statistics say Christians are involved in worldly, immoral behavior as much as non-Christians are. So what's the point? Oh yeah, that's right, they get money. 9% of Christians have a biblical worldview. The 9% are more likely than other Christians to be biblically moral. That's encouraging. Uh, that there's that few. Your mind must have a biblical mindset. In other words, we don't want to just rule your actions. And this is what a lot of atheists don't seem to understand. It's like, we can coexist. They don't want to just rule your actions. They want to rule your mind, bro. Futile, empty thinking is anything not thinking about God. If you ever wonder why Christians have such a hard time embracing reality and science, just look to that command. Wow, ACLU doesn't really want to protect liberty. Only 20% of Ohio believes evolution should be exclusively taught. I wonder what that number is now. I don't know who it was that was teaching the sermon. This is nuts. Loss of common sense as a result of darkened thinking. I mean, just just this kind of terminology and the way that they phrase this, it's just, it just strikes me as so creepy. They don't say why the other people don't have common sense. They just say that they don't have it. Resisting God results in a hard heart. Uh, Jeremiah 6.15, it's an Old Testament verse. Sinful people lose their conscience. So, again, it's this idea that um, infidels are less moral people, even though we get the exact opposite if you actually look at the crime statistics. Those consumed with lust, abandoned reasoning. Just the fact that this is coming from a church, you know, so far that has no sex scandals, outstanding, but, you know, that can change at any time. They have a gajillion dollars in money that they could be using to settle any kind of potential lawsuits um, so to keep the stuff from getting out a lot of times victims tend to be very want to keep stuff private and don't want to go public with stuff
Christians have a new attitude centered on Christ as opposed to an attitude centered on reality and science. It's like you're so focused on this one thing, on this one set of commands and stuff coming from this lore that you're unwilling to kind of take an objective look at the world around you. Um, my worldview doesn't revolve around atheism so much as it revolves around just reality itself. Depressed people should concentrate on others as opposed to... I mean, that's that's like the only advice that they give. Um, it's not go see a doctor or a therapist, go on meds. Uh, it's just concentrate on other people. You'll be fine. Whoever walks with Christ walks in the light. All you have to do is swap Christ out with something else and the verse, or I mean that command is just as weak. Um, yeah, I need that on. It's like you could just swap that out for Allah or Muhammad or Jim Jones or Wait, isn't Jim Jones like an automotive seller? Christians fill their lives with the pursuit of pleasing God as opposed to helping other humans or improving their own lives. They become a burden to everybody. Relativism is confused. Yeah, the only thing that's confusing is that statement. Christ, or Jesus' glory came in his humiliation, therefore you should be willing to be humiliated and be made fun of, as opposed to using that to incentivize a change in your own life. The presence of the church holds God's wrath back. Um... So here you've got a protector that's protecting you against um, someone who's supposedly friendly. Uh, and it's just another way of extorting you out of control of your own life. Um, well, we're being nice and we're doing you a favor. So you really ought to owe us something. Jesus will appear in the air to rapture Christians. <laughs> um, yeah, just any second now. Then the Antichrist will come. Okay. Uh, the whole Antichrist thing, like, you hear that a lot applied to atheists. Well, you're Antichrist. You're one of the Antichrists. So has Jesus appeared in the air then? Um... Because earlier you said that you would. And this kind of thing waxes and wanes depending on what they're trying to prove and when they're trying to prove it. God will judge us. We will fall short. Um, more threats and terroristic threatening. John three thirty six. If you aren't in the book of life, you will be damned. People um, seem to forget that John 3.16 um, has to do with redemption from something that God is contemning you for. It's like they forget that the whole reason why you need to be redeemed is because you're being condemned. Luke 16.9, use your money wisely, use it to get into heaven. 10% tithe is mandatory. This is coming right after the verses about um, obeying the church and that you owe the church something. It's like, really? That's convenient. Malachi 3.10, we're going back to the Old Testament again. Give tithe and God will bless you. Tithe should be larger post-New Testament. 100% belongs to God. So now you see why there's all these verses about 
um, the church is holding God's wrath back, and um, you know you owe the church something. The church is who you should be confessing your sins to, and you should be confessing publicly. You start to see why all that stuff is there, and it really all just goes back to money and power. You feel happier when you give. Well, of course, when you're brainwashed to believe that you're giving to the right people and that you'll go to hell if you don't and that you're commanded to do so by a, a wrathful God. Oh, 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Give what you have decided in your heart. So if you're not giving a lot, then you must have a bad heart. You must be a bad person. Ask yourself what the eternal return on the investment is. Well, if you're giving money to the church, your return is zero, because they're selling you a bill of false goods. They had a pornography outreach program. It's like, um, of all the places that you're sending your money to, that's, that's the biggest priority right there. Money is a tool that you can use to enhance your resume and influence for God. It's not for bettering your life, it's just for bettering the churches. Philippians 3, 7 through 9, all is lost compared to Jesus. So again, just discouraging people from bettering themselves and their surroundings. It's just constant discouragement. I just wrote here ASAP, Psalm 73, 11 through 14, God is absent. I don't know what that means. It's true. Except for the fact that God isn't just absent, he's non-existent. Um, Matthew 25, 19 through 21, Master rewards the one who made the most effort to make money for his master. And aside from the whole um, point of the story being to illustrate to slaves how obedient they should be, um, it also is indicative of that there's this attitude in the church that what's yours is not yours. What's yours belongs to the church. And it's this constant, we own you. We control you. You owe us. Give us your money. John 10.10, 10, I have come that you may have life and live it to the full, with exceptions and exceptions and exceptions and exceptions. Um, not allowing you to live life really at all, unless it's through the desires of the church. Satan wants to steal, kill, and destroy. No verse there saying why. It's just stated. It's almost as if they're pulling this stuff out of nowhere. Satan wants to distract you with the momentary. Trivial, fun stuff is worse than the worst sins. I've got notes elsewhere about how bad and evil fun is. Um... It's like, it's not enough that they've got to ruin your life in every other aspect. They, they also have to just suck the joy out of it. Job 1, 8 through 12, Satan claims Job is dependent on stuff. Satan hurts you with nature. Oh, I thought God was in control of that, huh? You know, elsewhere in Job, it talks about how the earth is flat and is a disk and is, um, have the heavens supported by four pillars. I'm sure those are just artistic license, though. And they know exactly that the earth revolves around the sun and is a globe. Sure. <sighs> Satan has limited power. Of course, it's limited by however much the church says he has it in any given moment. 
Matthew 25, 30, third guy is thrown out into the darkness where there will be weeping and a gnashing of teeth. Um, ugh, again, more terroristic threatening. Um, this time with fear of missing out. Satan isn't all-knowing, except when the church says that he has special knowledge. Uh, Satan will discourage you with accusations. No verse there to illustrate it. Your real enemy is incorporeal. So, there the church is trying to convince you that you're never safe unless you're doing what they want. Here's an irony. Uh, Luke 12, 14 through 15. Beware greed. Eh. And I'm sure the church is the only one that's not being greedy. So give us your money. Come on, we're, we're the only ones that are really selfless. People don't usually have extra anything. 70% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. Um, <laughs> I think it's something like 40% uh, to, or, or more of people are also Christian. So whose fault is that? Good grief! How many weeks did they go on about this? It was like months straight. Uh, perspective of the rich man. Number one, my money is my money. Clues that you have this attitude. You don't loan. You hoard stuff you don't need. Um, and of course, it's the, the church is the one who will be the decider of what you do and do, don't, do not need. Ecclesiastes 5.15. Naked you're born, naked you leave. If the church had their way, I'm sure that would be the case. The world is God's possession. Jesus usually talks about money along with the warning, terroristic threatening. Money brings security. He was trying to make himself independent of God. Again, here's the idea that, I mean, it, it's just, I keep reading the same stuff again and again and again. Um, and it's just more of the same. And, and it's no wonder I know so little um, like academically speaking, and even then I know a lot, um, but relatively, you know, I know relatively little because of this kind of attitude that you have to be dependent on the Bible and God and the church, um, and if you do, uh, then you're a bad person. So I didn't, and I wasn't, and I was dependent. Proverbs 30, 8 through 9, give us neither poverty nor riches. I, if I am rich, I'll disown God. Again, it's this attitude of if you have what you need, or if you're well taken care of, you know, if you take care of yourself, then you're a bad person. What you really need is to be constantly dependent on the church and living from paycheck to paycheck. Hebrews 13.5, be content, don't love money. Of course, give us all your money. The rich man was a fool for not concentrating on his heavenly goals. So, of course, the answer is, give the church your money, as it always is. It's like, do you guys have any other lesson you want to give aside from, give us more power, give us more money? The perspective of eternity. Again, selling a bill of false goods. Luke 12, 33-34. Lay up your treasures in heaven. What you do with your money is representative of your heart. So if I spend all of my money on health care and paying my bills, then my heart is saying that I want to survive, you idiots. Christian Joel was stupid. I think I'm going to stop it here just because I'm trying to keep each one of these under half an hour. This does not spark joy. <laughs> it sparks uh, madness.